and we are live. Great. Excellent. Well, hey, y'all. Thanks for joining us for the first Fermentology mini webinar. I'm Erin McKenney. And I'm Lauren Nichols. And we're scientists in the Applied Ecology Department at North Carolina State University. We won't be holding a live Q&A, but we will be consolidating any questions that you enter into the Q&A feature on Zoom or that you post on social media, and we'll answer as many of those as we can. Yeah, so thanks for joining us. Um, the microbial world is full of mysteries. There are millions, potentially trillions, of kinds of bacteria and fungi in the, on Earth. And we know more about the deep sea than we do about some of the bacteria and fungi that are most important to us. But luckily, for those of us stuck at home, some of the answers might be lurking in your kitchens. Whereas most microbial systems are incredibly complicated and difficult to manipulate, experimentally, there's one system that's not only easy to manipulate, but is getting more attention than usual right now. And that is, drum roll, sourdough. I bet you didn't see that coming. So sourdough isn't anything new, in fact, Humans have been baking bread with sourdough starters for thousands of years. People were baking bread before writing was even invented. But most of the bread that we bake now is not sourdough. It's what we would call yeast bread. Commercial yeast that you can buy at a store or order online and that seems to be in short supply right now is usually only one of three strains of a single species of yeast called Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is the only yeast sold commercially for baking. Yet we know that there are thousands of species, even hundreds of different genera of yeast that exist in the world. The yeast that you buy in stores has helped us to make bread reliably and quickly. That's great, but sourdough, that super old technology that was first used by your great, 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 you grandmother is still being produced. But why are some people still using that really old technology rather than modernizing and getting with the times? Well, the old way makes really good bread. And one of the reasons it makes such good bread um, is that wild sourdough can take advantage of all of that yeast diversity, but it also has a secret weapon. It has bacteria. See, in sourdough, the yeasts are kind of like tiny machines. They're consuming starches and sugars as their fuel, and they're expelling the carbon dioxide and alcohols. And lactobacillus bacteria, this bacteria that's special to sourdough um, and other fermented foods also consume these starches and sugars, but they produce something else. They produce acid. And this contributes that sour flavor that some sourdough breads have, but it also does something else. It keeps other microbes, so unwanted molds and other bacteria from growing in your starter and these unwanted microbes can't tolerate the acid, whereas the sourdough yeast can tolerate the acid and so they persist and they eat the sugars and the starches and they fart delicious gas bubbles. And so together, the bacteria and the yeast create this stable ecosystem within the starter. But as we mentioned, there are hundreds of yeasts and bacteria so why do we find certain lactobacillus bacteria and certain yeast in some starters and not in others? And how do different yeast and starters contribute to the aromas and the textures of the breads you bake in the end? Well, we do know quite a bit about sourdough, much of which you'll hear in the coming weeks as part of this fermentology series. You'll have the chance to hear from experts around the world about how to bake bread, how to characterize the taste of your bread, and even about the future of bread and where we might find new untapped flavors. But at the end of the day, as with most questions related to microbes, despite having thousands of years worth of experience, baking bread, there's still a lot we don't know. So there are still lots of yeast even that don't have names. We know absolutely nothing about them. Um, what is their role in this alchemy of turning flour and water into delicious bread that we eat? And we know that yeasts exist in flour and on the skin of the fruits that are probably in your refrigerator and even on our hands. But what determines which yeast and bacteria end up in which starter? 
So to answer this question, a group of us from across different universities teamed up a few years ago to find out more about the science of sourdough. We reached out to the online ethos and implored bakers to send us a sample of your precious sourdough starters. And we were absolutely blown away by the response. Yeah, over 500 people ended up sending us sourdough starters from around the world. Some of these starters were only a few weeks old. Others had been passed down from grandparents to grandchildren and divided and shared throughout the years. And some were regarded as some sort of family heirloom pet. It was pretty amazing. Um, and so what we did once we had these starters is we used the latest advanced DNA sequencing techniques to study the entire microbiome. So this is the complete list of everything living in each one of these starters. And what we found was that while many of the starters were dominated by Saccharomyces cerevisiae, so what we know is baker's yeast, we found 70 different kinds of other yeasts in the starters. And even for the Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that baker's yeast, we find that there's diversity in the strains, much more than any of the commercial varieties that are available. And in addition to the yeast, we found 70 different types of lactobacillus bacteria. And sometimes uh, sourdough was dominated by a single type of lactic acid bacteria, and sometimes there were multiple species coexisting in a single starter. So just like that, by including sourdough starters, our repertoire of yeasts expanded from three varieties of a single species to dozens of species. So let's just put this into perspective, right? Um, if yeasts were dogs, then bakers today largely work with three breeds of dogs in the vast majority of baking. We'll call them the yellow lab, the black lab, and the chocolate lab. But when you look at diversity in sourdoughs, we learn that there is a vast diversity of different breeds of dogs. There are poodles and basset hounds and Great Danes. We discover German shepherds and chihuahuas and an occasional Afghan hound. But it's not just the breeds of dogs. There are also other species. Yeah, we encounter wolves and African wild dogs and foxes and not just one type of fox. We find red foxes and fennec foxes. And the more we look at sourdoughs, the more varieties and species we encounter, and we realize how little we know about any of them because we've been spending our time trying to learn how to work with Labradors and trying to figure out what the difference is between a yellow Labrador and a chocolate lab, rather than trying to figure out what makes a gray wolf different from a pug. Exactly, so once we knew which microbes were in each of the starters, we used information um, that the bakers had shared with us, including where their starter lives, where it was created, and how it was maintained. This helped us to figure out why we see certain microbes in some starters and not in others. So far, we find that yeast tend to vary depending on your geographic location. We think that this is because of the climate where you live. We found in other studies that geography tends to be a pretty good predictor of fungal diversity and yeasts are a type of fungus, so this makes sense. The bacteria in starters, however, do not seem to follow the same geographic rules that yeasts do. Instead, they seem to vary depending on factors within your home, like what kind of flour you feed your starter and whether you keep your starter on the counter or in the fridge, but we're still tweaking these models, so it's still preliminary. And we could start to ask other questions, questions that we thought we knew the answer to already such as, is San Francisco sourdough actually different from other sourdoughs? Common understanding, if you've ever had San Francisco sourdough bread, is that it's different because it has a specific kind of yeast that's called Lactobacillus San Franciscensis. So it's even its namesake. But when we look at global starters that we got, we see that we find this bacteria in sourdoughs as far and wide as Australia and Germany and France. So if San Francisco sourdough is special, it's not because it has this one particular kind of bacteria after all. So even though we're learning more every day about the microbes and sourdough starters, this project has also been incredibly humbling. For every question we answer, 15 more pop up that we don't have any idea what the answer is. And even apart from the wonders of microbial discovery, we've also discovered an incredible community of people through our partnerships with bakers across the world. 
We met a baker in California who shared the story of Herman, a Yukon starter that has survived earthquakes and family tragedy. And we've met professional bakers eager to share their trade secrets and partner with us as scientists to learn more about the glories of bread. Together, you have formed an incredible welcoming community online to share stories and wisdom with both seasoned and aspiring bakers across the globe. And yet, despite all of this work, we still have questions about these microbes and how they affect bread. And that's why we need your help. We want you to make wild sourdough starters at home. So luckily, you only need a few materials to grow a microbial garden, flour and water, a paper towel, a jar, and some spoons, and a little bit of time and patience. We will help guide you through it the whole way. We have instructions on our website and an interactive Facebook group where you can ask questions anytime and get advice from expert bakers who've been handling sourdough way longer than any of us has. And so what we'll do is after you've fed your starter 14 times, you'll take a few measurements. And so for most of you, this will be on your 15th day, but some starters have faster metabolism. So you might want to, you might get there before the 15th day, but on this 15th day, you'll watch your sourdough over the course of the day, keeping track of how fast it rises. And ultimately the measurement that we want you to send us is how high your starter eventually reaches the maximum height your sourdough eventually reaches and how long it takes to get there. And we'll also ask you to sniff your starter and tell us a little bit about its aroma. So maybe it smells like bananas or vinegar, maybe it smells like smelly feet, and maybe it even smells like beer. But and finally, we'll ask you to send us two photos. So one from the aerial view of, of your starter and one from the side when it's at that really peak bubbly height. Together, your data can help us to answer questions that we couldn't answer before. So as we mentioned before, yeast tends to vary with geography, but we still have a lot of unresolved questions about how geography affects your starter. You see, our original study was an exploratory study, not necessarily a controlled experiment. Here's a map of the places uh, where each starter had migrated from across its life from its original place of creation. Some starters stayed close to home. They're kind of home body starters. Others traveled halfway across the globe. There's a lot of variability here that we couldn't control in the original experiment that included starters of different ages and life histories. With the new wild sourdough project, by growing new starters from scratch and all in your own homes, we'll be able to compare your starters directly without having to tease apart age or migration. We won't know which microbes are in your starter, but the rise and aroma of your starter can tell us a bit about the metabolism, like what those microbes are doing in there. And we can learn something about how geography ultimately affects the rise and aroma of your sourdough. Yeah, and we're also curious about different flower types and how that might affect your sourdough starter. So for some of our previous work, we know that different bacteria and yeast are present in different types of flour, but we don't know how these different inputs might affect the mature starter. So if you have several different types of flour at home, we'd love for you to grow several different starters and compare them to help us explore how different flours affect your starter. And we know that flour, um, people are concerned that there's a limited access to flour right now and we understand that. The project only requires a cup and a half of flour to grow a starter. So this is perfect if you only have a little bit or if you have a little bit of random leftovers of some strange flowers hanging out in the back of your cabinet that you don't know how to use. But if you only have time to make a single starter, that's fine too. And we're excited for the data, but we're really excited to share in your experience along the way as well. By sharing your questions and observations, we can actually come up with new experiments and directions together. We really want to make this a collaborative approach. So ultimately, Aaron and I and the scientists in our lab, we're all stuck at home too. So we're locked out of our labs without all of our fancy lab equipment. And so we want to join you in exploring ways to continue being curious about the world and solving microbial mysteries together. And 
If you're a teacher and want to use this project to build lesson plans for kids or learning modules about chemistry, history, biology, evolution, or ecology, please do. We've made some that actually span science, math, um, and even language arts, but we imagine a world in which everything could be taught through fermentation. Of course we do. So as humans, we've been baking bread forever. And it is what it has always been all about communities, communities of microbes, communities of scientists, communities of bakers, and communities of people. While we're all practicing social distancing, we can still come together as a community. Please join us as a community of scientists, bakers, and microbes. And I'll add that because we're a small team, the fastest way to get general questions answered will be social media right now. But if you have big ideas about sourdough or fermentation or think we should be doing things differently, send us an email. Um, in the meantime, check out the project and the instructions on our website listed on this slide. And thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks everybody for coming. Hope we see you next week at subsequent fermentology um, talk. Yeah, and we'll consolidate questions uh, that have been listed on the Q&A or on YouTube or on Facebook and try and answer as many as we can. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone.